Hello and welcome to Prof. Dale's Property Video number 21. I'm your host, Dale Whitman. In this video, we're going to do an introduction to the law of landlord and tenant. We'll begin with a little basic terminology. Many people might say, well, I don't have a lease, I just have an oral agreement or a handshake with my landlord. But in fact, if you are a renter, even under an oral agreement, you do indeed have a lease. It's simply an oral lease if it hasn't been committed to writing. Do you also have an estate in the real property? The answer is that you do. And in a minute, we'll talk about the uh, terminology that's used to describe the different estates that a tenant can hold. What do we call the estate? Let's take a look. There are four kinds of leasehold estates that tenants can hold. The first one is the fixed term, sometimes called an estate for years or a term of years. The second is the periodic estate. Periodic estates have a definite period of time, such as a week or a month. So they might be called a week-to-week -week periodic or a month-to-month -month periodic estate, or even a year-to-year -year periodic estate. The third kind of estate is an estate at will. That's one that doesn't have any definite period associated with it at all. And the fourth one is really not an estate or a tenancy. It's called an estate at sufferance, but it's really just a condition in which the previous estate's been terminated, but the tenant has not yet vacated the premises, and the landlord hasn't decided whether to remove the tenant, really to evict the tenant, or to allow the tenant to stay and charge the tenant additional rent. So while the tenant is in that kind of hiatus, that uh, twilight zone in which the landlord hasn't made a decision yet, we call them a tenant at sufferance. Now let's take a look at how each of these estates works. The fixed term, or estate for years, has a definite time period. It might be to the tenant for a certain number of years, or it might be to a certain date. Either one will work fine. Termination is automatic when the fixed term expires, and what that means is that neither party needs to give the other any notice to make the leasehold estate terminate when the term is up. A periodic estate, on the other hand, has a definite period of time. As we mentioned, it might be a week, a month, a quarter, or a year. And when each period ends, it automatically renews itself unless one of the parties has given the other the appropriate notice to terminate the estate. So a week-to-week -week or a month-to-month -month estate might last for many, many years if neither party gives the other appropriate notice to terminate it. It might occur for more than 21 years, but surprisingly, there's no rule against perpetuities violation because the law considers the term of the periodic estate to be simply one period. The common law prescribed the notice periods that had to be given in order to terminate a periodic estate. Let's take a look at those. There are two rules that have to be satisfied when one of the parties gives the other notice to terminate a periodic estate. By the way, this applies whether it's the landlord giving notice to the tenant or the tenant giving notice to the landlord. Now, the first rule is that you've got to give the notice a full period in advance of the termination date. If it's week to week, you've got to give it a week in advance. If it's month to month, you've got to give it a month in advance and so on. For a year-to-year -year periodic tenancy, giving the notice a whole year in advance seemed somewhat excessive to the common law judges, so they said that if it was a year-to-year -year or longer tenancy, then six months' notice prior to the termination date would be sufficient. The other rule is that the notice has to cause the estate to terminate at the end of a regular lease period, such as a lease week or a lease month. In other words, you can't give a notice that will make the estate terminate in the middle of a period. Notice that the lease week, month, or year doesn't necessarily correspond to the calendar period. In other words, the lease month might begin on the 10th or the 15th or the 18th or the 20th of the month rather than on the 1st. Now, landlords often set up their month-to-month -month tenancies so that they do correspond with the calendar month but it isn't necessary to do so. So let's take a look at an example of terminating a month-to-month -month periodic tenancy. 
We'll assume that the lease begins on January 1st, and it's month to month, so it'll renew itself on the first day of every succeeding month. On the 10th of May, the tenant gives the landlord notice that the tenant wants to terminate the lease. The question that we have to think about is, what's the earliest valid date that that notice can give for terminating the lease? The earliest date has to satisfy both of the rules we mentioned. The answer, of course, is June 30th, because that's the earliest date that meets both rules. It's both at least a full month in advance of the termination date, the notice on May 10th and the termination on June 30th, and in addition, it is the last day of a regular lease month. We couldn't make the lease terminate on May 31st, the last day of May, because that wouldn't be giving the notice a full period in advance. We couldn't make it terminate on June 10th, because that wouldn't be the end of a normal lease period. So June 30th is the earliest date that satisfies both rules. Now, many states have changed the required notice periods by statute. So if you're concerned about this, you need to take a close look at your state statute to see if it's been changed. But some other states continue to follow the common law rule. Now let's take a look at the notice that's required to terminate an estate at will. The common law was very simple on this point. It required no advance notice at all, so that literally the landlord could say to a tenant in an estate for will, move out tomorrow. Or the tenant could say to the landlord, I'm moving out tomorrow. And either way, the notice would be adequate. Many states, however, have taken a fresh look at that and imposed some notice periods by statute. Commonly, they're in the range of anywhere from 7 days to 30 days. Now, these periods count from the date the notice is given. The termination date does not have to be the end of a period because there is no period with an estate at will. Uh, there's just a continually running tenancy, and if you have to give a notice a certain number of days in advance, you simply count from the date you give the notice to the termination date. In addition, either the landlord or the tenant might die, and that will terminate a tenancy at will, or if either party gives a purported transfer of their interest in the land, that will also end a tenancy at will. So the tenancy at will is thought of in some ways as being quite a personal relationship. Now, many times people enter into informal leases in which they don't say specifically what the nature of the tenancy is. Here's an example. The landlord says to the tenant, I'll let you live in the apartment over my garage for $300 a month. You'll notice they haven't said whether it's periodic or not, or at will. If it's periodic, they haven't said what the period is. So nothing is said about the type of estate or the term of the lease. The courts are probably going to construe this as a month-to-month -month periodic lease. What they'll do is take a look at the frequency with which rent is being paid, which in this case is $300 a month, and they'll say, ah, that must mean the parties intended it to be a month-to-month -month lease. So that means that any time there's regular rent being paid, the courts are likely to construe the arrangement as a periodic lease, and what that means is the tendencies at will usually arise only among friends or relatives where there isn't any regular rent at all being paid. This means that tenancies at will are usually quite rare. Now let's take a look at the tenancy or estate at sufferance. That's a tenant who holds over, that is, doesn't relinquish possession and move out when the lease ends. By the way, in recent years, a number of states have had to deal with the situation of a former owner of real estate who didn't pay the payments on their mortgage loan and they've been foreclosed and uh, haven't moved out yet. And quite a few states treat that person just like a tenant who holds over and say that they're a tenant at sufferance. Well, when you have a tenant at sufferance, the landlord has two choices. The landlord can either elect to treat the tenant as a new periodic tenant, or the landlord can treat the tenant as a trespasser and use legal process to remove him or her, to evict them, in other words. So there's a choice to be made there, and until the landlord makes that choice, the tenant is called a tenant at sufferance. The landlord can exercise the election 
by giving the tenant notice, or written notice would be preferred, or by filing a suit to remove the tenant if that's the way the landlord decides to go. If the landlord elects to allow the holdover tenant to remain in possession, what's the period of the resulting periodic tenancy? Well, it's hard to find any thread in the cases. They vary. Sometimes the courts will say, we'll base that new month or periodic tenancy on the basis of the term of the old lease up to one year. So if the old lease was for a year or more, now we might have a year-to-year periodic tenancy. Other courts will say, no, we won't look at the period of the old lease. We'll instead look at the way the rent was being paid. And nearly always that's monthly. And so you get there the result of a month-to-month periodic tenancy. Some courts say it's not periodic at all, but rather a tenancy at will if the landlord allows the tenant to remain and decides not to evict the tenant. So it's really quite a mess to figure out what a court is going to do. Each state has sort of gone at this on its own. Now we need to wind up by saying a few words about oral leases and the statute of frauds. The statute in most states governs leases that are longer than exactly one year. A few states say two years or three years, but one year is far and away the most common. Now what that means is that an oral lease for exactly one year is okay, doesn't require writing. Likewise, a periodic estate for any period up to and including one year is okay even without a writing. And in addition, a tenancy at will can be created without a writing. So you can see that quite a wide variety of lease types can be created with no writing at all. Now suppose the parties don't comply with the statute of frauds. They enter into an oral lease that purports to be for a five-year period. Well, we know that that can't work the way the parties agreed to because that would be a blatant violation of the statute of frauds. So what happens? Well, if the tenant takes possession, most likely the court will construe that as a periodic lease based on the rental payment period. Once again, nearly always the rent is being paid monthly, and so the courts will construe it as a month-to-month periodic lease. However, all of the other terms agreed to in the oral lease are going to govern the resulting periodic lease. And of course, the periodic lease is exempt from the statute of frauds because it will be for less than one year, as we talked about a few moments ago. That completes our discussion of the introduction to leases and landlord-tenant relationships. In our next video, we'll talk about the differences between leases, contracts, and licenses. If you have questions or comments, email profdale01 at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.